Hello, uh, good afternoon. It's always uh, rather hard to be the after lunch speaker, you know, competing with sweets and desserts are not quite um, an easy one to compete with, but I'll try and I'll make sure to start off with a story. So look at this picture which I have here. So this is New York, it's 1910. For many years, this was the most important business to generate money. Logistics, moving things around in the States. If you're after real money, this is where you wanted to start. They also had super fast horses, because of course, DHL was needed in 1910 too. But something was happening at this time in the, in the period, in the growth of humankind. So you're looking at Fifth Avenue in New York, and the street is full of horse-driven carts. But look closely. There's one solitary car right there. So this is the first indication that technology had started changing the most established business in the States. But the ratio is still one car to 100 horse-driven carts. It's the first sign of change. Because what's happening in this period of time is this. Henry Ford is putting together his first famous Model T in Detroit. This was the technology of the time. Now let's move forward, just two years. We're still in New York, it's still Fifth Avenue. Look at the scene. It looks entirely different. So what we're looking at over here is an inversion of that ratio. We now have 100 motorized cars and only one horse-driven cart. Can you see it? Look closely. It's here. Now, beyond the analogy of the cars and the horse-driven carts, what's the point that we're trying to make here? And that is, why have the horse-driven cart owners not changed into car drivers? Did they not see the writing in the, on the wall? Did they not see that technology is changing fast? So they had all the assets and the abilities to migrate from driving a horse to driving a cart. They knew you know, the geofenced locations, if you wish. They knew the routes in their market. Why did they not adapt to the changing technology? Did they not see this writing on the wall? Well, no, they did not. And none of the horse drivers became car drivers. And they didn't for this reason, because horse drivers and organizations very often define themselves by what they already do and are incredibly unable to see the writing on the wall. You know, we drive horses, we don't drive cars. We sell ice flakes and we don't sell fridges. We manufacture fax machines and forget those guys who are adopting email, that's just a fad. Or we're banks and we won't touch Bitcoin. Or we print books and we won't go digital. So I think my question to you today is, who are the horse drivers amongst you? Which are those processes in your organization which you need to reconsider, which you need to rebuild? What is the writing on the wall that is facing the gaming industry today? And this is what I'll spend the next 10 minutes talking about and trying to identify how we can move from driving horses to driving cars. Only two days ago, the Times of Malta, which is the main publication here in the Maltese Islands, ran this story commenting on tomorrow's Sigma event. They said, in two years' time, 81% of companies in the gaming industry are going to be competing on customer experience alone. That's quite a statement, right? And this is exactly the horse that we have in our stable, I believe. And we chose to tackle it at Ebo, the company at which I am CEO. So in Europe, we have almost 4 million people working in contact centers. There are about 35,000 of these contact centers in the European Union. It's huge. 80% of the time, this obviously smacks of the Pareto principle, 80% of the time, our agents in these call centers are answering the same repetitive questions time and time again. But we have technology that can change that. What are we doing about it? 
And not only do we have this staggering statistic of four million people, four million of our labor force in this industry, but when you look at the data around satisfaction, you actually find that 75% of those individuals who call call centers to get their question answered are dissatisfied with the service they receive even if their question is successfully answered. This is crazy. This is the writing on the wall, or in this case, well, the screen, which is showing us the need to change. And this is exactly what we face when we come to onboarding of gaming customers. Our funnels are creating too much attrition because our onboarding process is slow. And sometimes, retaining customers and reducing churn from this initial onboarding funnel is absolutely fundamental. So the more we understand the behavior of our customers, how they spend money, what are their activities like, what is their social profile, the more we could build segments of look-alike audiences that we can go after, that we could market to. And each look-alike audience, each cohort of prospects, is going to have different needs, different messaging. So we need to be able to run our customer experience at scale with multiple messaging journeys for each of these different cohorts that we're trying to attract. And yet, we still have four million people answering the phone. McKinsey say that 45% of all the tasks which we handle in our organizations could easily be automated using technology which exists so we're not talking about the Ford T, which is yet to be developed. We're talking about stuff which is out there and which is tested. AI is one such technology. And AI doesn't only make us better at talking, it makes us better at listening. In fact, to some extent, today's conversation with you should not be called ready to talk, which is what appears in your agenda, but perhaps it should be called ready to listen and ingest data patterns, and then talk, right? And do so at scale, no matter what the demand is. Is it World Cup season, so we need to handle 50,000 inquiries per hour? Or is it off season, and now we're handling 2,000 inquiries per hour? How does our customer experience team scale accordingly? And we need to be able to do it 24-7, at scale, on multiple platforms, be it voice, so be it Alexa, Siri, Google Home, be it web chat, or be it any type of social platform that we're on, and in any language. This is where you realize that the horse that we're driving is a broken customer experience and satisfaction model, which we inherited 40 years ago from the early days of telecoms. But we're still using it in our business today. We need to be ready to capture new insights, and then, create personalized conversations based on these insights. And it's no surprise that this industry, the CRM industry, the Customer Relationship Management Tool industry, is, according to Forbes, set to grow to $40 billion at the end of this year. And the reason is because if true AI we could capture more insights about our customers, we need to put them in a silo in a data store, which can allow us to eventually mine that information and create the conversations which we need. But this is the problem that we have. Most of us have forgotten that the data, the terabytes, the petabytes of data which we have in our CRM, very often lay stagnant. We're very able to capture data, but we're very unable to effectively act on the data we have collected and personalize the conversations that we wish to have with our customers based on the data which we store. In other words, our conversations with customers today are a one-way street. We just repeat whatever script our customer agents are taught to repeat time and time again. This needs to shift. We need to have a two-way street type of conversations, whereby the experience that we create is focused on the value that we could provide the end customer. And this is really my pledge to you today. We need to reignite conversations with our customers through artificial intelligence. We need to make the data that we are storing in our CRMs actionable. How many of you are confident 
that your data engineers back at office are actually acting on the insights which have been captured in the CRM. If they have been captured in the first place. We need to leverage these terabytes of data. They're sitting idly in your CRM. So we need to move from being data collectors and passive listeners to actually proactively communicating and identifying what are the relevant next steps that we should take. And based on the personal needs of each customer, what type of messaging should we formulate. And if you read any of the Harvard literature around AI, it comes to one simple conclusion, and that is AI is a bloody great prediction machine. And this is really the fundamental truth behind AI. If we look at patterns and act on them, we could predict what the next steps of our customers will be, and as a result, how we should communicate with them. So we need to connect artificial intelligence agents, virtual agents, to the data we have in our CRM store to make sure that every customer gets a tailor-made VIP experience with us. We need to listen and we need to speak. Because the truth is customers don't want adverts. They want to have conversations with us. And at some point in time, we forgot this reality. Today we come to accept that the average landing page will only convert 2.35% of the traffic that hits that landing page. That's crazy. And your marketing team will certainly cheer and give you some very positive reports if they hit 4%. Wow. Is that all we expect out of marketing? A 2.35% conversion? Our mailing list results are slightly better, almost at 25%. But those mailing lists are themselves contained because of regulatory requirements, principally the GDPR. And the amount of people who are happy to receive a call from a customer service agent, 0%. We've got a broken approach towards marketing. And we've come to accept that that's okay, and that's the norm, and that these results that our marketing teams give us are just fair. I beg to differ. And I believe we are in the advent of artificial intelligence-driven conversation marketing. Marketing which is driven based on relationships and communication. And the truth is, sometimes, whilst our human agents feel awkward, socially awkward, asking some questions to customers on the phone, when the question comes from a bot, it is not socially awkward. In other words, you could get away with more detailed, structured question sets when they come from a bot, rather when they come from a human. More so, we can ensure that we are not simply reactive, so we talk to our customers when they re reach out to us, but we can proactively speak to them based on patterns that we see in our CRM. This is really data-driven marketing. Now, in truth, conversation marketing is not a new trend. I mean, we've been having conversations with our audiences, with our customers for years, hundreds of years. But the reason I'm here today speaking about AI and conversation, data-driven marketing, is because the advances which we've seen in technology and the shifts we are seeing in customer behavior merit this type of discussion. Now, conversations can happen at scale, and they can be personalized and one-on-one. -on -one. And that is absolutely critical because it's happening on the customer's timeline not on ours, so it happens on their need, not when our organization is ready to provision its call center, individuals, experience, and scripts. It's almost like being in New York in 1910, but actually having an Aston Martin which you could drive. That really changes the gear and the speed of the game. So thank you very much for hearing me out. I wish you a great afternoon.